In Romans chapter 3, let's get some passages here, starting in verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they are entrusted with the oracles of God. What then if some did not believe? Their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy words, and mightest prevail when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come? Then Paul says, their condemnation is just. As we look here at Romans, let's get a little bit of background here. Uh, first of all, Romans 1.16 says that God, the gospel, the message, in, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And it looks like about the next three chapters, Paul proves that point. He proves the point that everyone needs the gospel. Number one, non-Jewish people need the gospel. Verses 18 through 32. The Gentiles had violated the truth they knew. They knew about God. They knew all about God, but they did not honor Him as God. Now, also the Jews as well. We might have a third category in Romans. We might just have good, moral, non-Jews. Early in Romans 2, 1 and following. But would it also apply, those verses would also apply to, obviously we have the Jews in here as well. Gentiles knew a whole bunch of truth. They did not live up to it. They violated it. They, they kicked God out of their head. Good moral people are not consistent. And third, the Jews violated the law that they were under. And so what Paul has done is that obviously all men need the gospel. We also have some Jewish overconfidence in chapter 2. Many Jews did not live up to what they knew to be right. And he chastises them for that. And they also thought that being circumcised was kind of a charm that guarded them from God's wrath, and it did not. Circumcision was of no value if you were sinning. It was not a substitute for obedience. It was not insurance against God's judgment. One other said the ultimate sign, the evidence, the membership of the covenant, of God's covenant, was not circumcision. That was not the ultimate sign. Neither was it possession of the law of Moses. Neither was that the ultimate sign. The ultimate sign, the ultimate sign was your obedience. What the law demanded, what circumcision should have reminded you of or pointed you to. So their circumcision did not make them what their obedience proved they were not. At the end of the day, what you are is how you live. How you live. Paul is going to deal with some objections here in Romans chapter 3. The first objection he's going to deal with is in verse 1. They might say, Paul, it seems that you've made circumcision and God's law meaningless in, in, in saying that circumcision will not profit you, the law will not profit you if you do not obey. Seems like you've made all of that meaningless. Seems that you're saying that there's no advantage in being part of the nation of Israel. What advantage has the Jew? What is the benefit of circumcision? Seems like you're saying that none of that means anything. That all of that was valueless. And this is not necessarily an imaginary objection. I think one writer's right. This may be what Paul heard in the synagogues. In Acts chapter 17 and other chapters as Paul preaches in the synagogues. This may be some objections he heard from his audience. Sounds like what you're preaching, Paul, is saying that all that back there was no point to it, had no value to it. But there's something else. Could be that these are arguments that Paul made when he was a Pharisee. The type of arguments he made before he became a Christian. 
the type of argument that he would try to make before a Stephen. So we may have Paul the Pharisee arguing with Paul the Christian now, or Paul the Apostle. That is, here's what I used to think. Here, here's an objection I used to have on my own mind. Here's an argument I used to make, and a lot of us, we could do the same thing. I was thinking that the other day as I was driving along, thinking, what if, what if Mark Dunnigan at 21 was sitting next to me in the car as I was driving down the road? What would I think about him? And let's say he's not baptized yet. He's a non-Christian. What would I think about him as I listened to him talk? And what he, would he think of me? And I hope, and, and I might have a little hard time understanding Mark Dunnigan at 21. I think I might have a little bit hard understanding his vocabulary and terminology and what was in his head. And the conversation might go a little bit awkwardly or whatever. But I hope, I hope that he would look at me and say, you know, I'm glad you made the right choices. I hope, that, I hope that he would not look at me and shake his head in disappointment. I hope that that young man 20 years would say, I like what I like. I like how it turned out. Did good. And so I think a lot of times we can identify with arguments that we hear because we might say, I made the very argument myself one time know exactly where you're coming from. I know why you're saying that. What was the advantage of the Jew? What was the advantage of being part of the nation of Israel? Oh, big, big time advantages. Much in every way. But he's not going to talk about every way in this chapter. He's going to talk about that a little bit more in chapter 9. But you know what? I think he's just going to single in on one thing. He's going to single in on, you had the very utterances of God. It, it, but, but the advantage here, the advantage here is not some sort of once saved, always saved security. They thought, they thought that's what it was. They thought the advantage of being a, a Jew, a person of Abraham's ancestry was their ticket. I'm in, I'm in, I'm good, I'm in. And it wasn't that. It was never that. It brought a value, brought tremendous value, but the value was not this ironclad security. It was responsibility. To live up to, to live up to your circumcision, to live up to possessing the law. There are other advantages, as I said, I mentioned Romans 9, but they are entrusted with this. The very utterances of God. I like, I like how the Holy Spirit didn't say they are entrusted with the scriptures, even though that's not a bad word, or scripture is a, a great word, or the word of God. But the Holy Spirit decided here we're going to use another word. We're going to talk about God's word under the imagery of an oracle or an utterance. One writer said this, the very expression creates a strong case for the inspiration of the Old Testament, does it not? First, Paul clearly declares the Old Testament be nothing less than. The Old Testament, what is the Old Testament? What is the Bible? The Bible is nothing less than God, the very direct word of God from heaven. The very utterance of God. The very words of God. And second, second, what advantage, what advantage were there have been if Paul said, well, they were in truth with the scriptures. Of course, the scriptures are nothing more a collection of myths and fables and campfire stories. That would not be, there would not be any advantage for, for Paul to say, they were entrusted with Grimm's fairy tales. That, that wouldn't be an advantage. They were entrusted with fractured fairy tales. Like the old Bullwinkle and Rocky cartoons, if you remember that period of history. But it wasn't they were entrusted with Curious George. They were not entrusted with that. They, they were not entrusted with Madeline. That's not what they're entrusted with either. Even though those, those are all neat books. And neither were they entrusted with the boxcar children. Even though I love that book. They had God's word. The very utterance of the Creator, an utterance from heaven to men. God has spoken to men, and He gave to the Jewish nation. You are the custodians of that communication. Wow. What a, what a privilege. And it should have brought upon them the, the, the responsibility not only to teach at other nations, but live it to other nations. 
the utterances of God applies to the entire Old Testament. Every scripture is inspired of God. And that was committed to Israel's care. Indeed, to be the custodians of God's special revelation was an immensely privileged responsibility. And it had been given to nobody else. It had been given to no other nation. God did not have plan B. It was given to the Jewish nation. There was no backup nation there. That, oh yeah, by the way, they also have a, they're also the custodians. There was nothing like that. Interesting. There are some passages that remind us that in like manner with the New Testament, we've also been entrusted with something. 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. 2 Timothy 1.3 Retain the standard of sound words from which you have heard from me in the faith and the love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who, indwe who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted to you. Isn't that a neat verse? Everyone here tonight who's a Christian, everyone here tonight who's a Christian, has a treasure that they were given. The very fact that you can tell somebody what to do to be saved is priceless. You have a knowledge of the truth. You know where to go for the answers of life. I mean, I, I, I know, I know someone could come in here and rattle off like 10 questions, 10 really earth-shaking questions about eternity. And I know, I know most people in the room would get most of them. And so, oh, I, I know the answer to that one. You're like the guardian. You're like the gatekeeper. You're like the keeper of the secrets and the mysteries. And, but it's meant to be shared with everybody else. You're one of the knowledgeable ones. You're one of the enlightened ones. You've got this treasure. Maybe one more little motivation for personal evangelism. Who am I going to share my treasure with today? I've got treasure that is priceless. I've got a message that can change a person's life. It can change their marriage. It can change everything about them. It can change their eternal destiny. And I've got that. And I've, I've come into possession of that. And someone taught that to me. The second objection, I think, is what then if some did not believe? Their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? If some who were entrusted proved themselves untrustworthy, does this mean that God cannot be trusted? When Paul writes this letter, most of the Jewish people had not obeyed the gospel. A number had, but when Paul writes this letter, primarily the nation of Israel, predominantly most of the nation of Israel, is still outside of Christ and thus unblessed. Does that mean God has failed? Here is this nation that God selected. Here is this nation that God made promises to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do we explain the fact that most of the people in that nation presently, when Paul writes, have not come into possession of those promises? Has God's plan failed? And he will address a lot more of that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And in a nutshell, he will point out that the true people of God have never been, have always been less than the nation. There has always been a remnant. And that was true in the Old Testament. It's true today. And the people that are going to end up blessed are the people that God always said would end up blessed. That is, the righteous man would leave, live by his faith. And that's always been true and that's never changed. But, this verse, 
This is the response. Let God be found true. I think one of the neatest passages here in Romans. The word let means make a choice that this is the way you're going to perceive it. Found true means that that's the right, that's always the right conclusion. Whatever answer God gave was the right answer. Whatever God did was the right way to do it. Whatever decision he made, that's true. And, and human failure is only going to highlight that fact. Human failure only highlights the fact that God knows what he's doing and God is right. Even though every man be found a liar. Well, what that means is that God is still true even when no one agrees with him. And God is still true even, even if less than 1% of the human population at any given time on the earth obey him. God is still true. Even though we've got a fraction of a, of a percent of the human population taking God seriously, God is still right. God is still true even if he's opposed by many scientists or journalists or politicians or community leaders or educators or just everyday people. God's still true. Even if I can find no one on a blog who takes God's position. Even if I can find no one on the internet that, that backs God up. God's still right. Even if there's not one editorial in the paper that would take his point of view, God's still true. Nothing's changed. Applications. Number one, God is never to blame for our problems. God's ways are always right. If there's any disagreement between what the Bible says and what men say, no matter who the men are, God's always right. When we encounter any difficult circumstance or any hard situation, God always has the right answer. God's way of handling the situation is always the best and true way of handling a situation. God is true. In marriage, God's true. In morals, God is true. In parenting, God is true. In personal responsibility, God remains true. In death and the afterlife, what's that all about? God has the right answer. In priorities, God has the right answer. Concerning what sin is, God has the right answer. Let God be true. As it is written, we're going to go back to the, one of the oracles of God. We're going to go back to a specific utterance and demonstrate what Paul means by that. When he says, as it is written, not only is God true, but what God had written is true. Do you see that in the context? Let God be found true, but immediately we go to an as it is written, which means, let, well, that means let God's word be respected. That is, you can't separate God from Scripture. If God is true, then His word is equally true. If God is personally a God of truth, then whatever He said is true. Any attack upon Scripture is an attack upon God's personal integrity. God's personal truthfulness. One cannot say, well, I believe in God, yet I reject Scripture. That's not going to fit in Romans 3. Let God be found true also means let the Scriptures be recognized as true. And this is the Scripture, Psalm 51, verse 4, that's under consideration in Romans. And the Scripture says, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak, and blameless when thou dost judge. And here's one of those places that a little bit of context is important. This psalm is written after David is confronted about his sin with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah, even though he had it done, but somebody else did it. He was definitely an accomplice in that. And is lying about covering it up. Nathan the prophet has showed up to confront him. And Nathan the prophet has given David a story of something that happened. 
And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, here's the story. There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. It grew up together with his, him and his children, family pet. It would eat of his cup and drink, it was eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. You might have a dog or a cat like that or whatever else. And you might just love it and say, you're just the best in the world, and I love you and squeeze you and make, my, make, make you my very own. And you might talk to it and say, who's the best kid in the world? Who's the best dog in the world? And, you might, and that's kind of the scenario we have here. And I think a lot of us knows what, know what that's all about. And was like a daughter to him. It was like, it was like a member of his family. And you might even be attributing things to him. Like, you know, what, you know what the cat's saying right now? You know what the dog's saying right now? Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock to, or his herd to prepare the way for who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the one who had come to him. I mean, he, yes, he took the man's pet, killed it, and skinned it, and served it. That's right. That's right. That's what happened. David's anger burned greatly against the man. As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. And uh, Nathan said to David, you are the man. David, no, no, not the poor man who had the little lamb. You're not that man. You're the selfish, greedy, mean, rich man. You took that poor man's pet, killed it, and skinned it, and gave it someone to eat. That's the context of Psalm 51. And you know what David said in response? God called David, God compared David to a selfish man, about as selfish as it gets. David, you're just like him. You are that self-centered. You're that greedy. You are that mean. You are that evil. And you know what David's response was? That's me. That's Psalm 51. That's one application of what it means, let God be found true. That is, if I pick up the Bible... And I find that what God says about something I did or maybe a way I've been living or an attitude I have or whatever, and if God says to me, you are a wretch, if that's the message to me from Scripture, you are a major louse. Let God be found true says, yes, yes, I agree. I agree. That's the application. That's me. David did not say, I don't know, I don't think I'm that bad. I'm bad, but I don't think I'm that bad. He didn't say that. He said, God, you're exactly right about everything you said. That's me. That fits me to a T. In fact, I might even be worse than that. So that thou art justified. What that means, what that means is that one application would be is that when God calls us on something that we're doing that is sinful, that we make no excuse. We no longer blame others. Well, it's because of... We no longer make excuses for the sins of our loved ones, children, friends, or family. We no longer place any blame on God. That is why I'm only human or hard to be faithful in a sinful world or why did God make me like this? We don't do any of that. We accept God's solution. We fully repent. We teach people the lesson we've learned. I like what David said in Psalm 51 and verse 13. As a result, as a result of God confronting him, here's what David said that he was going to do. He was going to go out. He was going to share his experience with other people. And he was, he was going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. I'm, I'm going to let everyone know, don't do this. Don't do what I did. Don't make the same mistake I did. Don't go down that same path. I like that. I 
I think that's one way you know how if people have really learned the lesson from their past. That when they bring up their past, it's in a way like a teaching moment to someone. It's like, hey, you know what? Here's the way I used to live. Huh? I was I was young man or young woman. I was heading in the same direction. And let me tell you, let me tell you the truth about what that life involves. And here it's laid out. Don't do it. Don't do it. When people take their past and use it as motivation of young person, don't fool yourself. Been there, done that. No good. No good. That's what David said. That's what I'm going to do, David says. The third argument is, if my faithlessness sets God's faithfulness in bold relief, why should he find fault with me? He is really benefiting by my sin, so why should he punish me for it? Is it fair then for him to punish us when our sins are, in a way, helping him? Well, the first thing. There are some things that my sin and our sins do highlight. Our sins are kind of like a black velvet background. And God is kind of the diamond that sits on top of it. When I sin, it does demonstrate that God is holy. It does demonstrate that God's, superior, God's wisdom is superior to my wisdom. My sin does make God look really smart when you compare what he said and what I do and when I suffer for it. Yeah, God was right all along, wasn't he? God's, it highlights God's mercy, how much I don't deserve God's mercy. It only brings God's grace into kind of a bolder font. It certainly demonstrates the fairness of God's judgment on my sinful acts. It also cries out for the fact that I desperately need God in my life. When people sin, and, and here's the thing, I know sometimes things in the news frustrate us. Maybe it's some man that sexually molested people or kidnapped some people or the guy that, the transient that uh, strangled that girl or stabbed her. I think it was stabbed her recently. And although something in you says, all the men in the community need to go down and just get him and string him up right now. I know there's something in men that say, where are the men? Where are the men that say, we're not going to tolerate this in that community, that sort of thing. And I think there's a very, there's a reaction in you that sometimes feels that way. But you know what? Anything like that also demonstrates something. It demonstrates how desperately our world needs God. Any article that you see in the Oregonian or the news that somebody does something her terrible, you can make a collection of those. And you know what those articles would say? Those articles would say, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all those articles would add up to the fact that man needs God. All those articles would demonstrate the truthfulness of Jeremiah 10.23. I know, O Lord, that it's not in man. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. That's what all those articles would say. All those articles would say, let God be found true even though every man be found a liar. That God is right. All those articles would say that God has the answer for man's problem. That the gospel, the gospel is the answer. That's what all those articles are saying. And so maybe that's a different way of looking at scandal, political scandal, because it's going to happen. It's going to happen because no matter who you are and how smart you are and how talented you are and how cutting edge you are, you are no match for Satan. If you don't have God in your life, you are going to be whipped and beaten. That's, that's, just, that's the reality of that. No one's immune from temptation. Cut yourself off to God and the consequences are predictable. That's what all of that should remind people of. That is, I make a mess of things without Him. I know sometimes some of us must, might be frustrated about what's going on in the world, politics, and what uh, spending packages or whatever. And sometimes as Christians, we, we, need to, we need to make our influence fail. And we certainly can call our congressmen and write on things like that. But also at the other times, you guys, as God's people, we need to kind of stand back and say, let it roll. Let it ride. Let it happen. 
Because one lesson hopefully the world's going to learn here is you cut yourself off from God. You don't listen to God. You don't cry out to God. And, and a truth is demonstrated. You can't solve your own problems without him, mankind. You just can't leave him out of the solution to human problems. Yet my sin also does this. And I think, I think this is what God is getting at here. Yeah, there is a sense in which human sins b benefits God from the standpoint it makes God's plan look all that much smarter. It, when you compare God to man, it makes God just look holier. God stands out. God is the diamond on the black velvet. But there's a problem here. Human sin does something else. It causes others to stumble. Matthew 18. It causes me to lose my eternal salvation. It causes some to ridicule God, like David's sin. Yet David's sin did highlight, highlight God's mercy, but David's sin in 2 Samuel also caused a lot of people to blaspheme. It caused a lot of people to ridicule the God of Israel. It did that too. It turns people off from the truth. It undoes a lot of good. It hurts the people I love. And that's why God does. Even if my sin in a roundabout way benefits God's plan and only makes God's plan look that much smarter, wiser, it still, it still hurts a lot of people. And that's why God continues to judge it. Paul's response is, well, the Jewish objector has says, well, Israel's unbelief kind of make God look a little... Make, make God look good. Make God look true. Make God look smart. Make God look holy. Make God look merciful. Make God look just. That's, yeah, yeah. In certain senses, that's true. But that would have to be true of the sin of every other person as well. And if God is going to let off everyone off the hook, because maybe in some roundabout way their sins contributed to the glory of God, now, God's not going to be able to punish anyone. God's not going to be able to judge the world. That kind of reasoning would do away with the judgment of God or the judgment of the world by God. And here's some statements in Romans chapter 3 as far as does the end justify the means. There's a couple of statements that Paul says that people are kind of throwing around there. Verse 7 if through my lie the truth of God abounded to His glory, the next phrase there, or as we are slanders reported as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Those would be two examples or ancient examples of kind of the end justifies the means. What does the Holy Spirit think about that? That's what the Holy Spirit thinks. Did you see that? Here are two statements that Paul says. These are being tossed around. These are things that people are saying, well, here's what Paul teaches. There's the Holy Spirit's response. Their condemnation is just. The idea is, People like that forget evil behavior causes a lot of evil consequences. It should be self-evident to most men that such arguments are perverse. Even to make the argument, even to make the argument that the end justifies the means, that argument is coming from a head, a mind, or a heart that is not right with God at all. That's a perverse argument, and the only place it could come from is someone whose thinking is wrong, or heart is wrong, or mind is wrong. And the Holy Spirit's response is, the condemnation on a person like that will be a just, fair condemnation. Maybe there's one here tonight as you look at Romans chapter 3. You know, it's hard to come to terms with verse 4.
it is hard to swallow. It, it's hard to swallow that your mom and dad were right. When you're 13 or 14, sometimes you don't think they know much, and all of a sudden, by the time you're in your 30s, it's amazing how much they've learned in those years. And you almost start up to a point that you don't listen to them, and then the older you get, I think, the more you listen to them. In fact, the older you get, you'll say things like, after they're gone. And I think a lot of people who have lost their parents will say this. If I could only talk to my mom and dad about what they would do. I don't know how many times I've heard older people who have lost their parents say, I just wish I could talk to my dad about that or my mom about that. It is hard to swallow. It is hard to swallow that. Mm -hmm. You were right. But there's a bigger application of that. That is that God is right. I think that's what Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. There's a, there's a huge mark of maturity there. And I think there's a huge chasm. There's an there's a eternal difference between the person who just, no, I don't think that's going to work biblically. You know, who reads the Bible, I don't think that's going to work. And the person over here reads the passage and say, let's do it. That's the right way to do it. Between the person out there that just, I don't think that's going to work, and that's the way to do it. Heaven and hell is the difference between those two attitudes. Let God become true. In the Bible, we have people saying, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And the response is, repent. Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That was the right answer 2,000 years ago. And that's still the right and true answer. Whatever your need is tonight, would you come as we stand and sing?